Hello everyone, and welcome back to our course, Inequality, Economic Opportunity, and Public Policy, and the second of our on online lectures. I hope you are all well. I can certainly appreciate that the situation in uh, New York City has changed tremendously just in the week since we've uh, last met. So please take care of yourselves, take care of the uh, people you care about, and um, find an appropriate balance in, in all aspects of your life. Do keep me in touch um, uh, with your personal experiences if you are facing uh, challenges that in some way raise uh, important barriers in your ability to, to, to uh, meet the requirements of the course or uh, continue to be engaged in the day-to-day uh, -day and week-to-week -week activities of being a graduate student. Maybe in some small way I can help out. Uh, that said, let me just remind you of a couple of administrative things. Next week we'll have a discussion of intergenerational mobility in neighborhoods, uh, and Max will make a, uh, a presentation, or at least offer up a presentation, and I will speak to um, intergenerational mobility in theory, and we'll revisit in uh, uh, a little bit more detail the theoretical discussion we had uh, last week. Uh, with an eye to looking at nonlinearities in a degree of uh, mobility. I'd also remind you that next week on April 2nd, the uh, first draft of your paper is due and invite you to double check with the course outline as to uh, the requirements and the nature of that and, and the specific deadlines. But this week we're going to talk about geography, intergenerational mobility across space. Uh, I've posted an important presentation by Aman of a paper that uh, I hope you've all read, an, an influential paper by Raj Chetty, Nathan Hendren, and their colleagues in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which really advance the uh, literature on intergenerational mobility in the United States in an important way. And a lot of that had to do with the data that was available to, to them. So play a particular, uh, pay particular attention to that and the analytical framework that they develop to study mobility. Now the data has certain limitations. They're, um, they're able to track children only up into their early 30s. So that puts a constraint on uh, what they can say about intergenerational mobility uh, and it also conditions which measures they use. But I'm going to uh, present today a paper that I've co-authored that was very much motivated by the uh, Chetty et al. Quarterly Journal of Economics uh, paper. Uh, and it has to do with a comparison not just of intergenerational mobility between Canada and the United States, but also a comparison uh, within both countries. Uh, but let me get started with just sort of laying out the groundwork uh, and uh, the major message that I want you to take away. Right now, I think, in many circles, um, there is an important policy discussion around the nature of growth and the importance of inclusive growth. And I understand that term to mean growth that's of relatively more advantage to the relatively disadvantage. And equality of opportunity, equality of economic opportunities, is certainly an aspect of inclusive growth. We might worry about economic uh, opportunity for uh, instrumental reasons. If you have equal, equal opportunities, that means the full talents of the society can be utilized. It means that talents are going to bubble up from wherever in the socioeconomic uh, spectrum they uh, originate, and they will contribute to uh, greater efficiency, uh, more productivity, and more growth. But we might care about uh, equality of opportunity also for intrinsic reasons. In some fundamental sense, uh, this is an aspect of what many citizens consider to be fair. Uh, and uh, perhaps if we are confident as citizens that we have more equality of opportunity, we might be less concerned about re resulting uh, inequalities of outcomes. But um, while inclusive growth has many dimensions, it, I think, also includes the idea of equality of opportunity. 
The bottom line for public policy, um, you know, given that I've framed it in these terms, the bottom line from these two uh, papers, or at least in particular from the paper I'm going to talk about today, is don't let inequality in the bottom half of the income distribution get out of hand. Indeed, um, policymakers should strive to reduce that in a way that encourages labor market and social engagement. Okay. So if I had to give an elevator pitch, it would basically be <laughs> uh, uh, that sentence, if, if you'll permit me that much. That's our major takeaway. Um, obviously, there are a lot more nuances uh, than that. But let me motivate the paper with a couple of pictures and then give a couple of pictures that also summarize the conclusions. First, um, this is a picture we've all seen in class. I offer the um, trends in the United States in blue and in Canada in red of the share of total market income accruing to the top 1%. And these two um, countries, which uh, are very close uh, neighbors, um, have experienced similar trends. Uh, in the United States, the share of total income going to top 1% has increased and almost doubled in the uh, 40 years in this graph. In Canada, they've also increased significantly, peaking at uh, about 15, close to 16% in the mid-2000s, and then falling off since then. Um, part of that has to do with the uh, significant role of uh, the resource economy and particularly the price of oil in the Canadian economy. The growth of the top 1% was concentrated very much in the major central city of Toronto, but also in the city of uh, Calgary, which is the major uh, hub for the uh, oil industry. Um, we get similar pictures for other Anglo countries, but not for all uh, countries in, in the OECD. The point is, this type of inequality is on the rise. And I sort of wonder, is it this type of inequality that matters for intergenerational mobility? And does the difference in this type of inequality between the countries matter for intergenerational mobility? The second picture, and here's a version uh, of it you've seen uh, several times, the Great Gatsby Curve uh, across countries. Um, so we can ask ourselves not just which type of inequality matters, because the Gini coefficient now is focusing our attention on inequality in the great part, middle part of the, uh, the distribution. The Gini is not so sensitive to changes in the extremes in the top 1% or in the bottom part of the distribution, but it's focused uh, or it, it will pick up changes in the, in, the, in the broad middle. So does middle income inequality matter? And if we're going to learn something from cross-country comparisons, which comparisons are judicious? Which comparisons are appropriate for policy uh, uh, learning? Uh, and I'm going to suggest that the Canada-U.S. comparison is particularly uh, apt, in part because these countries share a lot in common, and, and in particular, uh, some fundamental values associated with what equality of opportunity means. It certainly may be that Denmark has a much lower degree of inequality and a much higher degree of mobility in the United States, but it's also a much smaller geographically and population-wise country with a different set of values, a different approach to immigration, education, and maybe the policy choices in some fundamental sense that the Danes are making are not appropriate to the U.S. context. Maybe countries just want to be on a different part of the Great Gatsby curve. And the third motivating picture is one that... Um, the presentation of the Chetty Hendron quarterly journal paper has already primed us uh, for. And I just take one map from that. Uh, um, we don't have to be too concerned about the particular measure here. It's the rank-rank uh, slope. The point is, though, 
that maybe for policy purposes, it's the comparisons within a country that matter more than between countries. After all, um, um, if we see a good deal of variation as we do in this picture in the same country, we might wonder about different policy choices, not just fundamentally different uh, structural institutions that policymakers can't do anything about. Um, and, and so I think that that's certainly the way the authors of uh, the paper sort of, I think, frame the significance uh, uh, of it. I'm going to suggest that perhaps the next wave in doing international uh, comparative work, um, which I th still think has a good deal of value, is to focus on both between and within country comparisons. And I'm going to highlight some data and measurement concerns that we address that as this literature unfolds further, um, uh, researchers should, should pay attention to. Two concluding pictures. First of all, we find that when we look at Canada and the United States, both between and within them, only a partial border is discernible. So the uh, light colors in this map of, um, of the two countries refer to regions, uh, commuting zones in the United States and census tracts in Canada that are the most mobile. And the dark red refers to the least mobile. So in some areas, there's a, uh, a distinct uh, border effect. Uh, but in other areas, that's not the case. And there are regions of low mobility that both countries uh, share. So there's something more subtle uh, going on here uh, that is missed by a simple cross-country comparison. Uh, the second graph is that uh, uh, we uncover um, a great Catsby curve for these countries. And um, now the symbols in this graph uh, refer to the almost thousand uh, subregions uh, of the two countries that we use uh, in the paper. In the vertical dimension, we have an attenuated version of the intergenerational elasticity, the uh, rank rank uh, slope. And in the horizontal direction, uh, the Gini coefficient. Um, measuring inequality in each one of these commuting zones or census tracts. The red referring to Canada and blue to the United States, and there's this positive drift that the least squares line shows us uh, in these data. And this sort of raises questions, as it should in your mind, as to what the causal story is. And we also explore a whole bunch of correlates and suggests that not only the structure of labor markets um, matter, um, but also the structure of, of families. And so that's sort of hinting, this empirical study is sort of hinting and sending um, 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 policymakers in particular directions in thinking about this, as well as future empirical uh, uh, research. Okay. Let me begin with a short summary of a public opinion poll uh, that was conducted now more than a decade ago, uh, 2009, and I was involved in doing this. Uh, we took a public opinion poll by, that the Pew Charitable Trust had done for the United States that asked uh, Americans about their understanding of the American dream and what policy can do to enhance it. We, we took that poll and we adapted it uh, to the Canadian situation and, and um, made sure the questions are appropriate and then um, put it into the field with a representative sample of Canadians, uh, a, a little bit over a thousand of them, um, a thousand sort of being needed to get reasonable um, uh, standard errors. And there, is a number of there are a number of different questions and themes in the, in, in the study. I actually have the study posted on my website if, if you're interested in exploring it uh, further. Um, but the point I want to make in this picture is that the American dream seems to mean the same thing to Canadians as it does to Americans. And the point of this is to suggest that 
the underlying values of citizens, how they understand or appreciate the good life or the, the goals uh, in, in life are the same across the two countries. So that if we examine differences in between, uh, between them, it's not so much differences in tastes or differences in public choice that puts us on different places on the Great Gatsby Curve. Canada being um, a middling country with middling levels of mobility and inequality, the U U.S. having um, high values of inequality and low mobility. It's perhaps not a public choice uh, uh, issue reflecting different values of the citizens, uh, but maybe something more fundamental and structural and maybe something that public policy can do things about. So when you ask them what the American dream means, uh, you, get oops, you get surprisingly uh, similar results. The uh, blue dots refer to the fraction of Americans responding eight or higher on a 10-point uh, scale. We ask uh, uh, each person drawn into the sample how they would rate being middle class from 1 to 10 um, and all the options in between as um, what the American dream means to them. Now, they, they obviously have... Um, they can choose all of these things and engage uh, all of the different uh, options. But at one extreme, there is this sort of notion of, of freedom that's important. The blue dots are Americans and the red circles are uh, Canadians. And incidentally, none of the differences you see here are statistically significant. And in fact, they're very uh, close to being, uh, <laughs> the point estimates to being the same. So this is a particular definition of the American dream that might be closest to parallel, paralleling what we understand in our studies as economists and in this course, the gradient between outcome and background to succeed regardless of family background. About 60%, a little bit more of Americans and Canadians rank that very highly as an aspect of the American dream. What's interesting, though, is also to ask them what are the uh, drivers of, uh, of, of mobility. And here again, um, the results are very similar, no statistical differences except for one, uh, the state of the economy. And this probably has to do with the fact that um, the survey went into the field uh, just after the Great Recession. It was, we were in the field in uh, late 2009. The recession hit the United States more severely than in Canada, and perhaps that's weighing on people's mind. But you can see, interestingly enough, that citizens in both countries see certain um, characteristics that the individual has no control over, race, gender, or luck, uh, as not really being important drivers of uh, um, intergenerational uh, mobility. I think you'll, um, as we go along, uh, we're going to suggest, in fact, that race is a really important uh, dr uh, driver and one of the important factors in understanding the differences in degree of mobility between the countries. At the other extreme, it's the choices that people make that seem to uh, have a consensus of, um, of being essential or very important in uh, um, driving mobility, hard work, having ambition. Um, maybe, um, maybe health is not so much open to choice, but there's a dimension of it. Uh, there's a certain choice to education, uh, uh, I suppose. And um, that, uh, that drifts down, but it's, 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 it's these two that really matter. And they all matter in the same way across these countries. So in this sense, I'm going to suggest that maybe these this is not a bad pair of countries to be making an international comparison of. Policy learning can probably happen more quickly. Uh, the citizens share values and that are similar. The most notable difference, though, uh, in this uh, public opinion poll was the view of the state. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm, not going, I'm not going to read this quote out to you. I'll, I'll let you read it. But the bottom line is that if you ask citizens whether government helped or hindered them in achieving the good life, a good deal 
a much larger fraction of Americans feel that governments is, government is more of a hindrance than a help. Uh, that said, there aren't strong majorities in either country suggesting that government is a help, but this is the biggest statistical difference between the two countries. So here I'm sort of setting up um, a view that maybe public policy is being used differently in the two uh, uh, countries. And maybe Canadians um, uh, see the government as a tool supporting their life's objectives and Americans not so much so. Either the, for ideological reasons, perhaps leaning towards a more libertarian bent in social values, or perhaps I think probably just as much, if not more likely, that government is not seen as being effective or efficient and, and therefore they'd be less, less willing to support it or feel that it gets into the way. Um, there is a good deal of research going on in this area, and in fact, my colleague and possibly your teacher in sociology, uh, Leslie McCall, is a real expert in this area. So I don't want to trend, tread too deeply down uh, this path, but you can see sort of the point I'm making here that um, uh, uh, Canadians and Americans are very similar, and then in some ways, with respect to public policy, there could be an important uh, difference between them, and maybe that feeds into our understanding of what they're like. So let's talk about how the statistical apparatus of um, this paper is put together. I guess one of the uh, subtext is that as empirical researchers, we should probably be agnostic as to which measure of intergenerational mobility that we uh, focus upon. Theory certainly lends us to the intergenerational elasticity and we care about that, we care about incomes, um, but the public, as sort of I, I just sort of suggested in that graph, cares about other things too and so do policymakers and um, we should be careful to frame our analysis in a way that doesn't exclude all the important dimensions of mobility. So I'm going to suggest we care about incomes and that the average incomes of children from different communities um, vary for three statistical uh, uh, reasons. This is our famous regression to the mean equation and if we take anti-logs um, and, and then take the average, assuming that the average of the error term is going to be uh, zero. Um, there's a little bit of a fudge here with because we're looking actually at the log normal distribution, but I'll put that aside. So the average income of a child's outcome is going to depend upon this parameter in the community that has something to do with absolute mobility or um, uh, economic growth that moves incomes up or down uh, across cohorts or across generations. It's going to depend upon our famous intergenerational elasticity, and it's going to depend upon the average income in the community. Uh, and we've talked about the measurement uh, uh, issues of the uh, associated with getting accurate estimates of, of uh, particularly this uh, variable. And in this study, uh, we're going to focus on child outcomes in their early uh, 30s. And as we talked about, that's going to lend a rather significant life cycle uh, bias uh, to any estimates of mobility. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Chetty uh, Hendren paper shifts over to a discussion of ranks rather than focusing on incomes. Because the cohort that we're studying or they're studying is just too young to get reasonable income uh, estimates. We're going to construct the Canadian data not to give us the best possible estimates for Canada, but to give us the best possible estimates comparable to the Chetty uh, paper, comparable to the United States. So we're not going to talk so much about uh, income and the intergenerational elasticity uh, in this paper, 
but we are going to use uh, this variable, the average income in a community. Um, the data are tax data, just as um, Chetty and Hendron uh, uh, use tax data for the United States. They are tax data for individuals born in 1980 and 1982. Now, because of a, a quirk in the way we constructed the data. We weren't able to get a, a cohort born, born in 1981, which is part of their study. But I don't think that's a bit, big issue. So we're going at this using a very similar type of data for an exactly similar cohort. And um, the full um, sample available to us of all the age groups is about two and a half million. And when we focus on these two particular years, we have over 600,000 observations. We have to do a number of cleaning up uh, uh, steps to create our analytical file. Uh, in particular, we have to have uh, what's called a postal code in Canada, which would be sort of the equivalent of the zip code uh, uh, here, in order to um, uh, define uh, the geography, which is going to be very important. And then we trim the data uh, and we use only those observations in which the um, average parental income over five years is at least $500 in, in, in US. Our suspicion, suspicion being is that there's some uh, measurement error of permitted incomes in the bottom. And in this literature, as, as you, you've read both papers, there's always this discussion about if you're going to estimate a log model, what do you do with zeros? And uh, people get wrapped up in this issue. Uh, for me, it's not so important because remember, conceptually what we're after is a measure of permanent income. And I don't see that any human being has a permanent income of zero. Uh, so I'm quite happy on conceptual grounds to sort of trim at the bottom. Um, Chetty and Hendron don't do that. Uh, in part, I think, if I remember correctly, a conversation I had with Raj uh, to include individuals who had experienced incarceration in, in, in the United States. And incarceration rates among some groups are, are really quite high. And so if people aren't reporting, they ascribe a zero to their income. And they have a big chunk of zeros in the bottom. So what's happening in the bottom is going to be slightly different uh, between these two papers out of measurement uh, 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 issues. If we care about incomes, we also care about position or rank. Uh, I think the sociologists in the room can empathize uh, uh, with that. Um, but citizens care not just about their income, but where that income places them in respect to some reference group they have in mind. And as Aman uh, as outlined in his presentation, we look at ranks in the national income distribution, even though we're placing children and their parents uh, in a particular geography. Or rather, children are placed in the geography in which they were raised, but then as adults can move to any part of the United States or, or Canada. And their rank is always in the, and their parents' rank is always in the national income distribution. And so, um, like the quarterly journal uh, uh, paper, we also run uh, this regression in which lowercase y is the percentile rank of the child regressed against the percentile rank of the parent. The error term has a uniform uh, distribution, and we're interested in these two uh, coefficients. This is a, um, a type of slope, but it's a slope in ranks. Okay, So it's not the, um, um, the elasticity. You know, remember how we define the elasticity. It's a relationship between um, um, the, the least squares definition of, of beta is the, uh, the ratio of the standard deviations of the two generations to the correlation coefficient. And this is much closer to the correlation coefficients. There are measurement issues. Um, they arise. Um, and we talked about uh, those, but they're probably attenuated, although we do have to take account of some measure of permanent income 
both on the left hand side and the right hand side of this equation. Um, and we're doing that only partially as best as we can with the data uh, at hand and it's to average over only uh, two years because our, our sample is still quite young. Okay, so the data gives us opportunities and it puts constraints on us. And we are, are always aware of uh, those opportunities and those constraints in conducting the study. More emphasis on this study is going to be put on this rank regression than on the intergenerational elasticity, which doesn't really appear because we just can't handle the, the biases in that. So uh, here are some descriptive statistics of the uh, percentiles uh, um, uh, of the parent and child income distributions in the uh, two uh, countries. Um, uh, th these are uh, average incomes in those percentiles. You can see in the United States that to stand on the top percentile or the top fifth percentile means a lot more income than it does uh, in Canada. And that's the case both for parents and for children. Okay, So uh, the income distributions are very different here. There's a lot more inequality here. It's more inequality at the top end uh, than here. Okay, a little bit of context. And here is a version of what Aman has already showed us from the, uh, the Chetty paper. It's the uh, rank rank regression. Here we have um, um, the parents percentile and for all of the individuals within each percentile, we take the average of the child's percentile and present each of these 100 uh, cell averages up here. And that's the same thing. Running a, re uh, uh, a least squares line through these averages is the same as running it through the, um, the underlying uh, microdata. But this uh, permits a clear graphic presentation of how linear the pattern is in the United States, although a little bit of nonlinearity at the bottom. But the fact that the slope is lower in Canada, the intercept is higher, and the slope is lower, confirming our, our prior that between the two countries, there's a lot more mobility in the United States than in Canada. Now, a little bit of a, uh, of a, um, uh, of a caution what we use in the paper are actually Canadians in the U.S. income distribution. So we convert Canadian dollars into uh, U.S. Uh, dollars, and then we place Canadians in the income, uh, U.S. income distribution, and that's the, the rank uh, they get. So I think this is something that's missing, or appears to be missing as this literature on within country analysis of intergenerational is moving moving forward. People are starting to make between and within country comparisons, but they are referred to mobility within very different distributions. And so we're correcting for that here. Um, but it doesn't at this national level make so much difference in the Canadian results. The gray um, uh, data being uh, Canadians in the Canadian distribution. Okay, um, but you can see the uh, slope is much shallower in, in Canada and if you're born at the bottom of the income distribution on average those children rise a lot further up the distribution up to the 40th uh, as opposed to uh, in the low 30s if you're born to bottom percentile parents. So that's the way to read this. If your parents were in the bottom 1% on average those children rise up to the 30th percentile in the United States, but the 35th in, 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 in Canada. All right. So if you were born, let's say, at the bottom fifth, you are much closer to the median uh, in, 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 if you're born in Canada than you are in the United States. The middle class, in some sense, is uh, closer to reach. But if you look at policy discussions, um, you know, 
they care, uh, we care not just about incomes, uh, not just about position, but also about directional mobility. And so this is often how intergenerational mobility is framed in public policy discussions. It's about upward mobility. It's about breaking out of poverty and becoming all that you can be, right? That's the American dream. So moving up the income distribution may reflect a nonlinear process, uh, but it interacts with other types of movement. You can't move up out of the bottom if you can't bust out of the bottom. So there's an intergenerational cycle of poverty. And clearly you can't move into the top, let's say top 20%, if somebody doesn't move out of the top 20%. Only one fifth of the population can be in the top one fifth at any point in time. So there are intergenerational cycles of privilege that might also be related with uh, uh, the degree of upper mobility from bottom to top. So we can imagine a five by five uh, intergenerational transition uh, matrix. We might want to focus on all 25 cells in that matrix, but I think we can motivate a story by just focusing on three cells. Um, the probability of moving from the bottom to the top, the bottom fifth to the top fifth, which we call uh, upward mobility or rags to riches mobility more colloquially. Um, the probability of an intergenerational cycle of poverty, of moving from being born in the bottom fifth to being an adult in the bottom uh, fifth, this bottom-bottom movement, intergenerational cycles of poverty or, or of low income, and then intergenerational cycles of privilege, of being born in the top and ending up in the top as an adult. Okay. And as we suggested a couple of lectures ago, with the transition matrix, there is also uh, measurement and estimation issues uh, that have to address non-classical errors. And we talk about those in the paper and address those in the paper. So here is a mapping of the intergenerational cycle of uh, low income, a bottom, the bottom to bottom of quintile transition probability for approximately 1,000 regions, about 700 commuting zones in the United States. We basically take this information from um, the Quality of Opportunity website that Raj Chetty and his uh, um, uh, team have put up. There's a handy spreadsheet from the Quarterly Journal of Economics paper. And so that's all available for each of these commuting zones, including Hawaii and Alaska. And then we have about 300 uh, census tracts, which are roughly equivalent uh, to commuting zones. Not exactly, but they're the closest. And they're also interesting to use because they often represent what we might call a county, uh, an administrative area associated with uh, some public policy choices in, in, in the community. The light areas here reflect a bottom-to-bottom -bottom probability of less than one-fifth. So in our intergenerational um, uh, transition matrix, if we had perfect equality of opportunity in which child outcomes don't relate to family backgrounds, every entry in that five by five matrix would be 0.2. Um, so if your chances are less than 0.2, that's considerable movement. The intergenerational cycle of poverty really doesn't bite very strongly in some regions of, the Canada, of Canada and the United States. Okay. On the other hand, the dark red um, represents a probability of more than 35%, above a third. Above a th more than one third of children raised in the bottom end up being uh, bottom end results. And there are communities in the more northern parts of Canada and in some areas um, uh, throughout, um, these are rather sparsely uh, populated areas that have those kind of um, um, very high chances of intergenerational cycles of poverty. Some of these communities here on the British Columbia coast and in the north are associated with um, uh, populations of native peoples. But we also see pockets of this 
in some of the southern states and um, also in some uh, commuting zones uh, in the Michigan, Illinois, Ohio uh, area as, as well. Okay. So just on this measure, you can see what's going to happen with this paper. It's not like the border, which is this dark line, divides these two uh, countries. Now remember, we're defining these transition matrices in terms of the cutoffs of what it means to be in the bottom fifth or the top fifth or, or somewhere in between in the United States. Okay. Um, as a side note, I'm working, I've been working too long and not making as much progress as I should on a paper that has to do with gender differences. Uh, and here's one picture that I've derived from it, um, a comparison between these young men and young women. And this refers just to the uh, Canadian data. This is the probability of, uh, of an intergenerational cycle of low income for women in this axis, and in the vertical axis, that probability for men. I've drawn this as a square, so the 45 degree line is equality. And so if a community uh, census tract falls below the 45 degree line, it's suggesting that the intergenerational cycle of poverty is greater for women than it is for men. The bulk of these communities suggests just the opposite, that in most communities, it's um, the men who uh, experience to a greater degree uh, the, uh, the intergenerational cycle of poverty. So there's something there to be studied. And, uh, you know, maybe you can take the course again next year if you're interested and, and we'll be presenting uh, 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 <laughs> uh, this paper. Just kidding. Okay. Um, but you can see the uh, challenge we have. There are five statistics we're interested in. The average income of a community, that in some sense is going to be uh, related to the degree of income mobility that we're interested in. These two parameters in the rank-rank regression, and these two intergenerational, uh, uh, these two cells of the intergenerational um, transition matrix. We also have P55, um, but for many communities, there aren't enough observations to be able to accurately uh, collect information on that transition probability. So we focus on all five of these. We have these five statistics for each of a thousand regions that cover two countries. So presenting our results in maps is not going to be uh, a terribly effective way of communicating things. And also I sort of stress the importance of being agnostic. I don't really know which of these is more important. I don't know how people trade off income, rank, and direction in their utility function or how policy makers make those uh, trade-offs. I suspect there might be a trade-off. There's more absolute mobility, then maybe we care a little bit less about relative mobility. Um, but the theorists haven't given me, the empirical economist, enough guidance on how to more formally model or structure that. So I'm just going to step off and try to be as agnostic as possible uh, to take myself out away from the data, not pose anything on it, and let the data speak. And one way of doing that uh, is through uh, a couple of clustering algorithms in machine learning. In this paper, we use uh, k-means. So basically what we're going to say to the computer algorithm, I'm going to give you these five measures for each of a thousand communities. And I want you to group communities that are most alike according to some metric. In this case, it's a Euclidean uh, 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 distance. 
and find the communities that minimize the between community uh, uh, variance. With k-means, we pre-specify the number of groups we want. And we do some experimentation here. But first of all, just asking for two groups is a check on our prior. If I tell the machine to group these thousand odd communities just into two groups across all, all of these uh, dimensions, will it find the Canada-US border? Will it exclusively group all of the Canadian communities together and all of the American? Okay. That's not to suggest that we feel that the optimal number of groups is two, but just to test as to see whether, in fact, we should just be comparing the two countries as a whole as opposed to bothering with a within-country um, comparison. After some experimentation, we did this for a whole bunch of possible uh, numbers of groups. We settled on four clusters as probably representing uh, the Canada-US uh, landscape. So here's what we find. First of all, the Canada-US border would only partially be chosen by this machine learning algorithm. It's quite distinct in these, this area. Now this part of Canada is actually uh, the most populous area in Canada, the Quebec City-Windsor uh, uh, corridor along Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Now, of course, this is the northeastern seaboard and uh, Michigan and Illinois and Chicago uh, all, all, all in here. But there is a clear border effect here. Okay. On the other hand, that's not the case in other parts of the country. Uh, this broad area, which is the more mobile area, if you've only got two areas, uh, spans the Midwest and the Western uh, uh, provinces. Uh, the gray areas are those in which we don't have sufficient uh, uh, data for all of our uh, measures. Okay, so that's sort of interesting. There is a border effect, but it's only a partial effect. Okay. Again, we're, then we can sort of start thinking about some of the differences between the countries and maybe start to pin together um, directions for a cause and story. Here are the results for the four uh, cluster uh, mapping. Again, the most mobile region spans the border, but the least mobile region does as well. So some communities in Canada have more in common with a large number of communities in the United States than they do with other parts of Canada. Okay? And so there's a, a low mobility problem here in the United States. There's a low mobility problem here in Canada as well. Um, this group, uh, group three, is almost exclusively with just a couple of exceptions, um, almost exclusively lying on the United States side of the border. Uh, and you continue to see this border effect uh, here. Uh, so what's going on? Um, we look a little bit at some of the statistics associated with each of these communities. So remember, the geographic definition here also has a parallel in the censuses of both countries. And so we can go to the census and pull off characteristics of these uh, communities. Uh, oh, this just describes um, in more detail the um, individual characteristics of the uh, two clusters, their average value of for uh, the um, variables that we're uh, interested in. Okay, I'll, I'll let you uh, look at that. Oh, and we're also a little bit cautious uh, about the border effect. So 
we just look to see how robust our results are if we just focus on communities that are within 600 kilometers uh, of, the, of the border. I'm just trying in my head to make a conversion between kilometers and, and uh, miles. So 100 kilometers is about 60 miles. So this is somewhere around 350 miles, let's say. Um, the great bulk of the Canadian population lives very close uh, to the border, uh, so we're not losing much there. Um, but this is just being uh, careful. Um, we had this in mind, and actually one of the referees of our paper also suggested it, so we, we included it in the paper. Here is the uh, Great Gatsby curve using that B coefficient, the rank rank uh, slope this time. So that's going to be attenuated. Um, it's not it's not the elasticity, so it's, we're not going to we don't expect to uncover as steep a slope, but it's still there. Uh, uh, and this line represents all of the statistics. Probably a little bit steeper if we just focus on on Canada, um, but I'm not sure that's appropriate because. Canadians are in the U.S. income distribution here. So inequality is associated with uh, less mobility. Uh, and that really is a segue to ask, well, what else is associated with less mobility? This is just a univariate result. And um, the other thing that comes out that's important um, uh, is uh, family uh, structure. Uh, so here you have here you have the uh, correlations um, between that coefficient, the relative length of mobility, and the different characteristics of the population in each of those communities. The fraction of single mothers who lived in that commuting zone or that census tract. The fraction who were divorced, married. The fraction of black citizens. Uh, and that is in Canada, we use the term uh, visible minority as well, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, this is a very interesting finding that we've got a very strong uh, positive correlation between the fraction of single mothers and relative uh, rank mobility, higher in the United States uh, than in, in Canada. A very different coefficient, a very uh, strong coefficient in the United States for the fraction of people who are black in, in, in the community. And actually in, the, in Canada, it's a negative coefficient. And um, the other thing I wanted to highlight as well is that um, the, the genie is, uh, is, is there. Um, and the other thing I wanted to highlight had to do also with uh, education. All right. Now, these things all go together, uh, you know, and, and we talked in our model. So, you know, we sort of have that model that we talked about last day in mind. We talked about those overlapping circles of family, market, and state. If there's labor market stress in a community, it can influence family structure it can influence how children are raised and outcomes are produced. But it's clearly something around how family functions in the context of robust or less than robust uh, labor markets. What sticks out for me is this coefficient as well. And we discussed this more in the paper, uh, and we hook to some existing studies that suggest, in our minds, that the national differences between these two countries has to do with the fact that that part of the population that is least mobile is a larger fraction of the population in the United States. There is that issue in Canada but it's associated with rather sparsely populated communities, um, communities um, that represented an important public policy concern, 
uh, the indigenous population, which, su which have suffered historically uh, from a number of terrible shocks and find themselves in this intergenerational poverty trap. In some communities, you shouldn't overstate that, in all, 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 all communities. Um, but then we point out that in the United States, those, th those red zones that we talked about uh, represent disadvantaged groups that are a much larger fraction of the U.S. total. So it's that group, understanding that group, and that's what I meant by an important policy implication having to do with inequality in the bottom half of the income distribution that's really important. The other thing, as I pointed out uh, to you, is that there is that border effect uh, along the uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence uh, Seaway. And that has to do, I think, with two effects. It's also associated with, I think, the disadvantages that black Americans face. And we had an interesting visitor here in the Department of Economics who presented a paper about the Great Migration, where that move of black Americans northward changed communities. Canada wasn't subject to anything uh, like that. And then the other thing that's very different, as I pointed out to you in the descriptive statistics, is just the overall degree of inequality in subparts of the United States compared to Canada. It's one thing to be in the top 1% in a city like Toronto, but another thing altogether to be there uh, in the top 1% in the United States. And also at the bottom end, um, the thresholds for poverty, um, the um, deep poverty rates, are significantly more in the United States than in Canada. And so it's inequality there that also um, uh, um, uh, matters. So that's my summary of the paper. I hope you have a chance to read it. I'd certainly appreciate your comments. And I'd invite those comments certainly to be placed on the website as soon as you're done the presentation. Um, suggestions for improvement, directions for future research, as well as just sort of legitimate questions of clarification are obviously welcome. But also insights that you've gathered from uh, these two papers that you'd like to share uh, with others. So I'm very grateful um, for having this opportunity to engage with you in, in, in this way. Um, I know we can engage in, in a straightforward conversation, uh, but this is our first couple of steps in our online learning. And if you have reflections or suggestions on how we can make it better, I'm uh, open to hear those. So please do send me an email uh, and keep me in touch on how you're doing. Certainly if something changes in your life that, that, that affects your performance in this course, let me know that. Um, uh, and I have some ideas how, of how we might enhance our online experience, and so maybe we can talk about those at, at some point. But um, again, I encourage you to uh, check the reading list and be sure you're aware of all the deadlines, and in particular the paper draft. Uh, we'll look forward to um, Max's uh, presentation next week on uh, neighborhoods, and we'll revisit theory in my presentation. Thanks very much, and all the best. Uh, to you.